Good morning and happy Friday. We survived again. We made it. And it went by really fast. I feel like every week is getting quicker and I have more to do than the week allows. And so I end up on Friday excited that it's Friday, but now kind of frustrated. <laughs> say a prayer for me. If you guys are praying people, please say a prayer for me. I might have to sew into the weekend. I got wedding dresses everywhere. They're behind me. They're to the side. They're in front of me. Ah, on Tuesday, I even did um, my video in my bedroom because it was too chaotic in here. I couldn't even find the floor. <laughs> so at least today we're a little bit farther than that. So, but all these wedding dresses are kind of all in, in stages of needing to be finished. <laughs> so say a prayer for me. But today is Friday. It is my favorite time when I can sit down and go through the word of God with you. And um, I love that. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you for joining me every Friday. Um, if you're getting anything out of this, give me a like, um, subscribe, um, share this with friends. If you've got someone who wants to dig into the word of God with us, um, grab your coffee or your tea, whatever you drink and um, grab your Bible. We are going to be reading Matthew 12. 1 through 14, Mark 2, 23 to 28, and 3, 1 through 6. So basically, the end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3, and Luke 6, 1 through 11. Now, once again, we've been really, really lucky. All three of our passages are very, very close. So I won't read all three. I'll read from one, and I was back and forth which one because Matthew and Mark each have a little something different that I love, and maybe we'll go back and talk about it. So I think what we'll do is we'll hover in Mark 2, the end of 2, and the beginning of 3. It's all about Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath, and Jesus heals on the Sabbath, and all the trouble that's going to bring him. So I'll give you a moment uh, to grab your supplies and uh, I'll put on the screen what we're looking up, mark them in your Bibles, and we'll be opened up to Mark. See you in just a minute. Okay, I am going to be reading, I'm reading out of the NIV, which is the new international version. But I have one over here that is my life application study Bible, and I've got some commentary at the bottom that help break things down. And then what we've been doing for this study is doing all four of the Gospels at the same time, because they're all talking about events from Jesus' life from birth until death or resurrection and a little bit after. Um, so this Bible here is the Chronological Study Bible. It puts it in order for me so it's easy for me to see what's next um and then but if you don't have one of those it's perfectly fine just grab your regular bible each week i put in the description what this week's reading is plus i'll put it on the screen um but then i also put next week's reading uh in the description too so you can be following along often i will also put videos. Um, the last couple of weeks we have kind of stayed in the same town and haven't really had any new archaeological uh, videos on towns but I love to put information like historic or archaeological of the area that we're in or something I find of interest that will help the study. So always look down in the description and see if you can find a video. Um, I'm not sure I will have one this week unless I run across one. It's the funniest thing. I will search and search and search for videos. And then uh, after I record the video and have posted it, suddenly they all appear in my um, newsfeed on YouTube. And I go, oh, sure, now you come up. <laughs> so my phone must hear me talking about it when I'm recording. So anyways, if I have any, I will stick them in there and sometimes even a day 
after um, I will I will put them in there but right now I don't have any videos for this week because we're in the same place we are most likely still in Capernaum or at least near uh, the Sea of Galilee you can look back at our uh, weeks past and I have some really neat videos on Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee and stuff like that and what it was like and some of the archaeological um, kind of digs that they've done in that area, which are really fun. So, but today we're talking about Jesus um, is Lord over the Sabbath and Jesus heals on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees, which are basically religious leaders, they are upset. Now, if you don't know uh, what the Sabbath is, it was a day of rest. Um, it was a day that they were to just give to God and also give their bodies rest. If you look back in Genesis, um, when God um, first created the earth, he rested on the seventh day. It took him six days to create, and he kind of showed us an example of working and then taking rest to sit and um just praise God and he even looked and said everything was good. Um, and then in Exodus, when Moses comes on the scene and all of the Israelites um, come out of Egypt, now they're wandering in the desert and they're about to go into the promised land, God gives them a set of 10 commandments, some instructions. And those instructions uh, were to not just like for them to jump through the hoops. Um, they were meant to give them a better life. So things like, you know, do not steal. That's kind of a good thing. Um, if everyone around you, nobody's stealing, what a much more peaceful life. Um, if no one is murdering, that's a really peaceful life. Um, and one of those in those 10 commandments was um, to honor the Sabbath, which what God set it aside to be Saturday. Uh, it was the seventh day. And that's just how the calendar land. There was no such thing as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They just were numbered, you know, one through seven. So um, the Jewish people then had known that they're not supposed to work. You know, they needed. God knows that our bodies need a break. God knows in order to keep our mind um, from overloading, our bodies from overloading, we have to have one day a, a week that we give them a break. Also, we need to be worshiping and loving God all throughout the week, but he wanted us to set aside a day where we um, kind of think about him. And we spend some time and since we don't have to work and try to make money and do all of those things um we have time to do things like um sit in the quietness and um, listen to his voice um stuff like that so the sabbath is really a good thing and jesus isn't speaking against the sabbath here what jesus is is saying you made way too many rules. I actually have it in my commentary in the Matthew uh, portion, Matthew 12, one through 14. My life application um, actually says that the Pharisees had established 39 categories of action forbidden on the Sabbath. So God gave them one law to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Just rest your body, rest your mind, be with me, hear my voice, you know, just relax. <laughs> and then the uh, religious leaders and the people were like, well, we need to know what this means. So they wrote 39 sections of things you couldn't do. So you couldn't work on the Sabbath. So what does that mean? Well, if you are going and ha um, buying grain or you're going and uh, gleaning grain and making a profit or selling, you know, the grain, that's work. Um, and we're going to see that Jesus' disciples end up in a grain field. So they had classified that as work, even though they weren't working. You know, uh, you could only take so many steps because, so you couldn't go on a nice stroll, which I think strolls are kind of relaxing, 
but you had to count your steps because you can only take so many steps on the Sabbath. And if you got too far out, you wouldn't be able to come home. <laughs> so that seems like more work than not to count every single step. I'm not even thinking about God at this point because I'm counting my steps to make sure that I don't break the Sabbath and I can get home. Um, and uh, then what else? There was just a ton of things. So that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with religious leaders right now um, who have created their own set of rules. And Jesus isn't going to follow their rules. He's only going to set God's rule. Uh, you know, he's only going to follow those. He's not saying that he's against the, those, just all the extra stuff. So we're in Mark 2, 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some of the heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? First of all, I want to know why they're following them. <laughs> They're just walking along the road and there's religious leaders every, everywhere they go. He answered, have you ever read uh, what David did when his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathra, oh, I don't know, Abathar, <laughs> the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even over the Sabbath. So, what's going on here? Number one, they are walking along on the Sabbath. Hopefully they're not taking too many steps. And they're hungry. And so, uh, the way the fields worked, and this isn't even stealing, uh, God had set it aside to help people who didn't have a lot of money. They would tell the landowner, you, you uh, harvest all the center and leave the edges around the uh, perimeter. Leave that grain so that when people, uh, you know, they just don't have money, they're hungry, they're homeless, they can come along there and, you know, and anybody can just grab some and eat some. And that's going to keep everybody fed and healthy. And that was, you know, just a regular practice. So Jesus and his disciples are just, it's a nice, beautiful day. They're walking along a grain field and they're kind of hungry. They're like, gosh, I'm getting hungry. So they grab a couple grains and then they roll it together. I wish I was going to try to find some um, wheat, a uh, little things but where do you find those I don't know <laughs> because we just don't use it like that anymore maybe this summer I'll have to grow some in my garden just so I have some as samples um, but I guess they would just kind of rub it in their hands and then they would get the little grains because the the rest of the weed kind of would just fall off um, and then they would just eat it um, I don't know how filling that is but you know they were just kind of nibbling, kind of like if you're going through your vegetable garden and you see a, a tomato, just kind of plucking it. And the Pharisees, are they hiding in the bushes? Are they following them everywhere they're going? I'm not sure why. They're right there. <clears throat> but they jump out and say, ha ha, got you. Why are your disciples uh, breaking the law? Now, are they breaking God's law? Because they're not really working, but according to the Pharisees, um, the loop, you know, that whole thing is you can't even get a little something for yourself to eat because that's considered work. <clears throat> so Jesus turns around and reminds them of the Old Testament. Now they all knew the Old Testament very well and they loved David because he was their king. Um, and he had... When he was running from Saul, you can read this in 1 Samuel, and I think it should be, if I'm not mistaken, around, it was like around 1 Samuel 21, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure. Anyway, it would take me too long to find that, but I think it's around 1 Samuel 21. You should find it when you're reading, 
Next to uh, where you're reading will be some areas that will tell you where to go read in the Old Testament or some other areas of the Bible. Um, but I'll tell you what the story is really quick. Um, David is running from Saul, who's going to kill him. He's the king before David. And um, him and his companions are running and they are starving. And they come up to where the priest has the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is an area where people would go to worship God and to offer their sacrifices. And if you walked past uh, the courtyard where they would uh, do some of their sacrifices, then there was like a curtain. And then in that kind of room, uh, before you got to the Holy of Holies, there's another curtain where you got to the Holy of Holies. Nobody's allowed in that room. Uh, the priest can only go once a year because God's presence is in there. But in this section before that, there is a lampstand um, and there is quite a few little things like there's an incense um, table and there is a table full of bread and it had 12 loaves of fresh bread um, that were to represent, um, they were representing the the tribes. There were 12 tribes of Israel kind of representing them before, um, before God. And every day they would take out, since nobody was eating them in there, because they're just kind of sitting there for God, um, they would take out the old ones and the priests could eat those because they would replace the old ones with, so that it was like day old bread. Well, David runs in and all of his men are hungry. He says, can you get us some bread? Can you get us something to eat? The priest says, we don't have any bread. We don't have anything here. But what we do have is the show bread or the, the bread of presence, um, like God's presence. Um, and we've taken it off and put the new, and usually the priests eat this, but we can give that to you and then your guys can keep going because they were almost starving to death. So Jesus brings this up and that probably upset the uh, Pharisees pretty much because they really revered David. So Jesus is saying, you're blaming me. If you blame me for this, you've got to blame David because he, uh, you know, kind of broke a law, but he was innocent. He's okay. So and in another version, it talks about the priests um, breaking the law by working on the Sabbath in the tabernacle but yet God considers them uh, um, innocent. So that's an interesting thing there too. But anyway, not to make this too long, <laughs> um, I really loved the ending verses in all of these sections of this first thing on the Sabbath with Jesus because Jesus in Marks turns around and says, then he said to him, the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. In other words, God made the law of the Sabbath for man to help him out, to rest his body, to give him peace, to connect him with the Father. And it's not that the man was made for the Sabbath. That's kind of backwards. That's saying that uh, the laws are so important that man is only here to fulfill them. Um, no, that's not the point that God had. The one in Matthew, I really love what it says. It is in Matthew 12, around 7. You'll see it's worded a little bit different. It says, if you had known these words, I desire mercy not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent for the son of man is Lord over the Sabbath. What he's saying is you aren't caring that people are hungry. You just want them to follow the laws, but it doesn't matter if they're, you know, starving to death and they're going to get weak uh, and they need to eat. <laughs> so you care more about them following these ridiculous laws, then you care about them getting some food. So I love that. I desire mer mercy, not sacrifice. That is actually a quote from the Old Testament as well. I didn't write down where it is, but I do know it is a quote. You can follow that 
in Matthew and then look in your um, little sidebar and find the verse and it will take you to the Old Testament. I think there's two different groups. I think we talked about it last week or the week before about mercy and sacrifice. Sacrifice being following the law, sacrificing to give to God. He wants your mercy. He wants you to have mercy on people more than uh, doing all the jumping through the hoops thing. So let's read the second um, time that Jesus, so it's like a, another day, Jesus goes into the synagogue, it's on the Sabbath, and the little minions are following him around again, <laughs> popping out everywhere, trying to make it, make sure he's done something wrong so they can get rid of him. So we are on Mark chapter 3, we're going to do 1 through 6. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. They're setting a trap. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. So the way they did synagogue, it's like their church. Instead of somebody at the front kind of leading the service and everybody's an audience, um, they all kind of sat around the room so that everybody's looking at each other and someone could stand up and, um, and then read some of the scripture, some, you know, they could all take turns talking. So it was really like a, like a Bible study more than, than a church service. Um, then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill, but they remained silent. So they tried to trick Jesus, but he kind of gave them a little bit of a, um, a little thing for them to solve, a little riddle. Um, but they remained silent because they knew he got them. He looked around them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said, stretch out your hand. And he stretched, the man stretched out his hand um, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So in another one, they were talking about setting an ox free. I'm trying to remember which one. Going off of... Is it this one? It may have been another one of his miracles. Oh, here it is. It's actually the one in Matthew, Matthew 12, 11. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take a hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So they got so technical. I guess they thought that they had written it down that to heal somebody was like being a doctor and that was working. So you weren't allowed to do that on the Sabbath. But are we supposed to just leave this man with a crippled hand and then, you know, his only chance to see Jesus and be healed? Um, he missed it because it happened to be the Sabbath. Well, that goes back to I desire mercy, not sacrifice. We're supposed to have mercy on people. We're supposed to, if, you know, if it's the Sabbath, our Sabbath, I know, you know, as Christians, we tend to celebrate on Sunday, um, but just having a day set aside for God. But say it's your day and it's your day off and you're like, you know what, I have to rest. But you pass a homeless person that has fallen and hurt, you know, maybe broke his leg or something and is laying on the side. Do you then say, oh, sorry, it's the Sabbath, it's my day off, and I have to rest, and I have to have time for myself, and I have to have time with God. I can't help you today. You're going to have to find, you know, somebody else who, who doesn't um, worship, or, you know, doesn't worship on the Sabbath, or doesn't um, worship Jesus, or be a Christian, or a Jew, or whatever. But basically, Jesus is like, you know, you would, if your sheep was to fall into a pit, would you say, oh, sorry, it's the Sabbath, I can't help you? Or would you think, you know, they had made this little law, this little side thing that says, 
oh, well, you can't do this, this, and this, but you know, your livestock, that would be mean to your livestock if you just let them, you know, not have water or fall into a pit. So you gotta be nice to the animals or, and also that meant money, you know, their livestock and the, everything was their money. Um, so they gotta save that. So they're saying, Jesus is saying, you have made concessions to save your animals. How much more important is a human's life? Why is it not important to set him free from this thing he's, you know, he can't work. He's probably in a lot of pain. And Jesus set him free on the Sabbath. Is that work? Or is that reaching out in mercy and in love? So that's where that comes in. This was a really, really good study. I found some really good stuff in the um, commentaries and I wanted to read a few of them to you. Number one was um, in the commentary on Matthew 12, 10. I just underlined, it had a whole paragraph, but I underlined this one sentence. The best time to reach out to someone is when he or she needs help. It's not like, if it's the Sabbath, reach out and help them. Don't say, I'll, I'll have to talk to you tomorrow because <laughs> it's the Sabbath. So the best time to reach someone is when they need help. And it doesn't matter. God doesn't care if you have to break a law to get there. You know, just help, help people. Um, so, I mean, don't, um, don't break, like, do not murder because you really shouldn't be murdering people, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I digress. <laughs> um, on my commentary in the Mark um, chapter 2, 25 to 28, it had this really good paragraph here talking about Jesus's example uh, to us. It says uh, in the second paragraph, the Christian faith involves many rules that are meant to gov be governed by love. That makes love the highest rule, but it also moves Christians towards personal sacrifice, discipline, and responsibility. Scarce resources in today's world, um, when confronted with rules um, of your own or others, you may want to ask yourself these questions. So if you're like in front of some rules and you're like, I got to follow that rule. I got to be in church every single Sunday you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Well, you know, you might have to break that rule to be kind to somebody. Um, or is there another kind of rule? Think about all the different rules in your life or rules that people put on you that are not from God. And then answer these four questions about the rules. Does the rule, um, does the rule serve God's purpose? So is this rule serving God's purpose? Does the rule reveal God's character? Does the rule help people get into God's family or keep them out? Does it keep them out? Okay, so here's one. Um, I remember a story, I'm pretty sure it was Calvary Chapel. Oh, what was his name back in the day, the one who started it? Now it's like gone, but I'll think about it here in a minute. Anyways, he was in LA and he was noticing that going into churches, they had kind of a, you have to wear a shirt and shoes and look nice. And, you know, some of the hippies and some of the homeless people had straggly hair. They hadn't had a bath in a while. A lot of them were coming in off of, you know, it's California. So maybe they were out by the beach and it's warm. So they didn't have shoes. And um, so a lot of churches were, um, kind of pushing them out of the church. Like, no, 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 you're too dirty to be in here. You need to have shoes on before you come in here. So those are rules that keep people away from God. We don't want rules that keep people away. So he started a church. He started Calvary Chapel in California and a bunch of his uh, board members, as they were making it, it became bigger and bigger, they came to him and said, all these homeless people or all these hippies are coming in and they're making the carpet dirty. And his response to them was, then take out the carpet. Because 
carpet is not as important as having them come to Jesus. So what rules in our lives are keeping people away from Jesus? And um, number four, does the rule have biblical roots that can be supported in the context of all scripture? Good rules pass all four tests. So that's another thing. They need to be truly biblical and not just biblical in one place in the Bible. It needs to span the Bible because the Bible has balance. You'll see in one area it talks about something, you know, that's kind of harsh this way. And another one has a ton of grace. And really it's a combo of the two. God's truth and God's character is a balance. And it's weighing mercy and obedience. It's weighing grace and um, works. It's like you, um, you're you saved by grace, but if you've been saved by grace and something isn't changing in your life, you're not becoming better, you're not striving, you're not hungering for reading the Word of God and it's not convicting you to make changes, something's off. Like, um, were you really saved by grace? It's not that your works save you. It's that they are the evidence that you were saved and radically changed. So there's balance in that. So you have to, you know, um, you, you just have to read the entire Bible and have the whole character of God revealed to you and the whole balance of everything. Um, also, a little note says here that the Pharisees or the religious leaders, the saddest part is, is their job was to turn people to God. But because of their pride, they turned people away. So their whole reason for being there, priests and, um, you know, the religious leaders, was to point people to God. And they were pointing people away from God. That's scary stuff. <laughs> That's really scary stuff. Um, and then when I turn over into Luke, my commentary is there. Um, in 6, 6 through 7, we're talking about um, positive and negatives. Like, which... So, the religious leaders were more concerned about the negatives. What rules should not be broken, what activities should not be done. Jesus was positive, doing good and helping those in need. Um, which would an objective observer say is more characteristic of your Christianity? The positives or the negative? Are you more concerned about what people shouldn't be doing than you are about advancing God's kingdom? Is your way of being a Christian the only way? That's a tough one. <laughs> you know, what if, you know, the gospel is, you know, God, is, Jesus is the only way. And there are some true, like, you. this is truth and you can't, you know, go from that. But then we've made so many other things, like, look at how many denominations. You know, one denomination is saying, um, you have to speak in tongues or you don't really have God. And the other one's saying the tongues, you know, are a sign that you're not really living for God because that's too, you know, I don't know, dramatic. I don't know. Some people, there's just, um, that's just one argument. But if the gospel is preached, there's, you know, that's the important part. The stuff on the fringe, whether you wear pants to church or a dress to church, whether you wear your hair up or where you wear your hair down, whether women have jewelry or not jewelry, whether um, women can be pastors or they can't be pastors, or this fringe stuff is not the gospel. You have to stay true to the gospel, tr true to the word of God, but the stuff on the fringe is just made to keep people away. We don't want to keep people away from God. We want to, our whole uh, job should be to point people to Jesus. 
point him to the cross, you know, and if it takes taking the carpet out of the, the church, then take the carpet out of the church. And I still can't remember his name because I'm on camera and I cannot even remember. And you guys in the comments, you're going to tell me. And I, as soon as I turn it off, I'll remember. Um, oh gosh, he's really, really famous too. Anyway, that's just how my week's going. <laughs> but I love you guys very, very much. What do you guys think about Jesus being lowered over the Sabbath? And here's another point. It shows in our Bible after studying and reading that Jesus was there um, at the beginning when God created the earth. Jesus was the word that the earth was created by. I know that's a really intense thought. We'll have to hit that on another day. Um, but Jesus was also there and he is God. He made the rules. For the Sabbath. He's the one that made the law, the Ten Commandments. So he's Lord over it. And if he says, forget the Sabbath, let's jump out and help someone, then he's Lord over the Sabbath. He rules over all the laws. So he can break them. <laughs> so, and you know, um, really, all the laws should be um, inspired by love love and God giving us peace. So that was harder than it should have been. I hope you guys got a lot out of that. I hope you had a really good week. I really am dying to hear what you guys think about this study this week and uh, what you discovered and what I left out. Maybe you've got some more information. Um, I'm dying to hear from you guys. So leave me a comment, leave me a like if you got anything out of this and I will see you in the next video. Love you so much and shalom my dear friends.